Die Kalahari is al meer as 20 miljoen jaar droog en dis een van die oudste woestijngebiede ter wereld. Species soos meerkaie het uitstekend aangepas by die omstandighede, vooral wat samenwerking en oorleving betref. En daarom het die universiteite van Cambridge en Zurich in 1993 met een omvattende navorsingsproject begin op die klein dierkies. Oor die jare het honderde, meestal Europese vrijwillige studenten, hulle lande verlaat om een jaar te kom help om data oor die dieren te versamel. On the actual premises itself, we've got two sites, Gane Vlakte as well as Rissenfrede. Rissenfrede is really where the, the hub is for the Meerkat project as well as the Mole Rat project. So it's making sure that the lab runs, functions perfectly because we do have mole rats in there. So we need to monitor electrics, um, the internet coverage, um, things like that uh, to facilitate that. As well as with Gane Vlakte, we have independence. Um, so independent researchers are basically researchers that have come in from other universities. Usually the birding groups are based over there and then we've also got a ground squirrel team that runs from Ghana Flakta. There's quite a lot of research groups coming to do research. Um, there's a bit of competition for access to groups. So my real job is to sort out those logistical research conflicts. Also to make sure that when people come out here, they can actually collect the data that they can to answer these fundamental research questions. But the core data collection comes from uh, a team of 10 to 15 volunteers, um, which I then manage. So they come at various stages of the year. So what do you need to become a volunteer? We ask of people if they have a degree in biology or zoology, a little bit of field experience, I used to watch Meerkat Manor when I was small <laughs> and I was trying to work out what I was going to be doing after I graduated. Um, so I remembered from Meerkat Manor that well, there was a research centre from Cambridge. So I just wanted to see what Meerkat stuff they were doing, read some papers because it's really interesting. And then as I was on the website, I found out they took volunteers. So I'm basically a Meerkat sound recordist. So I go out and I record the Meerkat calls with a microphone. Um, then I bring those back to the lab and I listen to the sound files and then I basically label each call that I've recorded that day. Um, and these calls are used in a variety of research, looking at changes in dominance to the effects of stress on meerkat. When the meerkats wake up in the morning, we aim to be there before they wake up. So we know which individuals are waking up to start with. We see the group wake up and then we'll spend several hours in the morning following them, collecting behavioural data, we leave them for lunch. On the most part it's because they're quite hot and tired and they go to sleep a little bit. Uh, we come back, also sleep a little bit. Most people rest quite a lot in the day and then we go back out in the evening and watch them go below. You wear them in the morning and then at lunchtime, about three hours later, that will tell us how much uh, weight they've put on from foraging that morning and then we weigh them in the evening so again that tells us their foraging success for the day and then comparing it to the next day uh, we learn how much they lose overnight uh, which is really helpful also if they're getting sick you'll start to see their weight dropping. Meerkat calls have a lot of different functions so there's some that they use to kind of spatially coordinate themselves so keep the group together um, and make sure none of, them, none of them kind of get lost on the way and there's other ones that are used to signal predators so to keep the group safe if one meerkat will see a predator they'll make a call that will alert all the other meerkats to the presence of that predator. Meerkat pups have a completely different set of calls to the adults. They have them for eliciting different responses. So they have some that are for telling, like, telling the adult when they're lost. If they can't see an adult, they'll make this call to try and get them to come and pick them up and take them back to the group. They have calls that are also distress calls, like you said, if they are a bit scared and a bit afraid. And they also have calls for trying to get food. A little begging call for saying, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, please come feed me, you know? And that changes when they grow up. Exactly. So about between three to six months, they actually physically lose the ability to make these calls. Um, and even if the meerkat is very hungry and still wants to be fed by its parents, it can't vocally actually make these calls anymore. Um, and then so it has to start producing the CCs and foraging for itself. So it's not the adults making a conscious choice to stop feeding the meerkats, it's that the baby meerkats can no longer produce this call. What was your first impressions of the Kalawari once you arrived here? Um, it's very flat <laughs> and incredibly dry. It's not like anywhere I've been before, um, but it's 
it's still very beautiful. We're very lucky we get to see the sunrise and the sunset every day. Um, so there's some very nice views out here. I think it's a great place to do research. The infrastructure that Tim has built up here is unique. You cannot find many places in the world like this. And it's a, it's a fantastic research opportunity for us to work on, on a wild population of mammals. So that's the other aspect of the job that I really like is the, the more human side, as it were. Um, so, of course, everyone doesn't get on all the time, especially in the height of summer when you have sort of five hours sleep a night and it's 40 degrees out. People can be tested, but on the most part, everyone gets on very well. And yes, we brine, there's different occasions and we might go camping and sleeping out under the stars. And yeah, it's, um, everyone has their own little little things, so. Do people fall in love, the volunteers? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, absolutely, it happens often. Uh, the biggest challenge would probably be not being able to leave um, for about six months, or some people don't even go on holiday when they're here. So they choose not to. So for nearly a year, they wouldn't leave the project. Van Zilsrus is a very small village close by. Um, every three months, we'll go to the hotel there and take everyone all 40 people, 50 people with us, and we'll have a big Sunday lunch. 